Okay. Bom dia, pessoal. Então, é, vou começar aqui fazendo a apresentação. É uma, é uma grandiosíssima honra para a gente do Lola estar com a doutora Jo Jorgensen aqui para falar um pouquinho sobre a experiência dela e a experiência dela de campanha, né? como foi a campanha dela nos Estados Unidos ano passado pelo Partido Libertário. E, 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 e não só isso, né? falar como é a experiência para as nossas para as nossas associadas para as nossas membros já que agora esse é um projeto em andamento do Lula é, para ajudar né e acompanhar candidaturas das nossas associadas que porventura ano que vem se candidatem a gente sabe que várias das nossas associadas vão se candidatar ano que vem e nada melhor do que iniciar com a doutora Jo Jorgensen aqui com a gente, para responder e para compartilhar, porque a gente sabe que atualmente os Estados Unidos é a maior economia do mundo, uma das democracias mais sólidas do mundo também, então nada melhor do que trazer uma pessoa com essa bagagem e que pensa tão semelhante a gente, né? É, no Lola, né, a presidente do Lola sempre fala, a gente sempre busca os 80%. Eu tenho certeza que aqui a gente vai ter divergências em várias áreas, né? Não só, eu e, e, não só eu e vocês, as demais membros, como também dentro da nossa diretoria. O mesmo vai valer para a doutora Jo, mas estamos aqui e eu tenho certeza que em 80% a gente tende a, a compartilhar as nossas ideias, como o mundo deve ser. Então, eu já vou passar aqui a palavra para ela, eu vou iniciar então no inglês. É, todas as perguntas vocês direcionam no final. Eu já vou iniciar com as perguntas, ela vai falar um pouquinho sobre a trajetória dela. É, e depois eu já inicio com as perguntas também. Eu quero agradecer, todo, antes de, de passar para as perguntas, eu quero agradecer toda a audiência qualificada que está aqui. Né? É, a Cecília Rodrigues fez um excelente trabalho de convite para membros do primeiro setor, do segundo setor, do, do membros do governo, iniciativa privada e do terceiro setor que estão aqui. Tá bom? Então, eu já vou iniciar é, com a doutora Jo. So, Dr. Joe, thank you very much for being here today with us. Uh, in Brazil, we have a different uh, time zone right now. So, they are, it's 1 p.m. there. So, it's, uh, uh, instead of having a Saturday lunch, they are here with you because we do, uh, we do admire you a lot. You are just like us. We, agree, we, have, we are in the same spectrum. And uh, last, next year, many of our members are going to be running for office. Oh, and, good. Yes. So it's an ongoing project, and they are all from the... My, the average are from the Libertarian Party, Novo, or, all the, or others, uh, other parties here, because we have many parties in Brazil. We have 40, 40 parties, active parties there. Last year, we elected uh, six women We had 13 members of Lola running for office and six of them were elected. Now we are, invited, we, we are inviting more women already in office to be part of Lola. So that's why we thought that listening to you and listening to your experience would be very rewarding. So now I, uh, we are here to listen to you and to, to know how was your experience last year. My experience was great. I really enjoyed it. It was great touring the country and meeting a lot of people. And what was really rewarding was people coming up to me saying, you know, that makes so much sense. I never thought about it that way. Can you, one, one of the first things that uh, our, our ladies want to know is that How did you, how did the idea come to you? How did you start thinking about running for office? Well, I actually ran for office in 1992 for US House. And then I ran for office in, um, I was the vice presidential candidate in 1996. So it was always in the back of my mind, but I really got into the Libertarian Party. First of all, I read Animal Farm by George Orwell in grade school. Uh, is that something you read in Brazil? It is. Oh, I'm sorry. It is, it is. I'm sorry, I had a problem here, but can okay. you? Okay. Yeah. So uh, 
when I, I, some people ask me, when did you first become interested in politics? And my answer. Yo, you are muted. Okay. Uh, on the campaign trail, some people would ask me, uh, how did you get interested in politics? And my answer was, I'm still not interested in politics. <laughs> I look at this as voting libertarian as an act of self-defense to keep the other people uh, you know, from running over our rights. So I read Animal Farm in grade school and I was very upset when I got to high school and I see that we have a senior class president and a city council and all these people making decisions for us. And I thought, well, that's not fair. Well, you know, it, it's like Animal Farm all over again, where we've got some people more equal than others making decisions for us. And I always thought that was wrong. And so, you know, I finally had the opportunity when I was older. And it's, it's, it's more that I don't like the that other people think that they can set rules for the rest of us, especially when they don't follow the same rules themselves. Isa, you are muted again. Um, oh, okay. it doesn't oh. sound muted. Okay. okay, now, now I know. So, uh, so were you always a libertarian, Doctor Joe? Yes, I voted libertarian. I, I, I learned about the Libertarian Party during my last year in college, when I went to college the first time, and so the very first vote, which was when I graduated, was for the Libertarian candidate in 1980, and I have voted Libertarian ever since then, because again, I don't see much difference between the other two parties because they both want to take away our rights and tell us how to live. The, both of the other parties are like Animal Farm all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, in Brazil, we have, uh, we, our system is very different. So we have, as I said, 40 active parties right now in the country. Wow. <laughs> and many of them, and many of them um, uh, have seen, ha are in the same spectrum, but uh, the members vote different, and some members, depending on the states, they are very different. It happens in the U.S. too, but not at ha not how it does in Brazil. But another one, other question that uh, before we start talking about more of your experience, one of our uh, elected uh, woman from last year, Marcela Tropia, she is mm -hmm. a council woman in the city of Belo Horizonte state of Minas Gerais, one of the uh, most uh, important cities in Brazil. She has a question and she wants to know what's your views on Biden's administration so far? Oh, it's been a disaster. It's been a complete disaster. We've got inflation going up. It, first of all, it's bad enough that we've got inflation. Then we've got people from his party saying, well, the inflation that only hurts people with more money. And that's absurd because, you know, of course, the people who have more money, they can afford to pay more for bacon. It's the people who have less money who uh, have a harder time. Uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, while, while I applaud him leaving Afghanistan, and I would have done the same thing, uh, I wouldn't have done it that way. That was just horrific. It, it's like... It, Anybody knows, let's say you're closing down the mall at night, you're closing down the store at night. The, the night security guard is the last person to leave. You don't have the security guard leave and then leave the shoppers in the store. It, it doesn't make any sense. And then he's trampling over people's rights with the vaccine mandate. Uh, and, and we've now gotten to a point to where if you think that you should have the right to choose whether or not you get vaccinated, you're called anti-vax. And that makes no sense at all. That would be like, you know, the people who say pro-choice with abortion, that would be like calling them pro-abortion. You know, there's a difference between a choice and whether or not you would want to do it. Yes, uh, you don't need to if you disagree with something and you don't want to enforce that, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna follow that. Just like with the vaccine, 
if you don't want the enforcement, it doesn't mean that you are not going to get the vaccine by yourself. Right. And in fact, some of the biggest pro-choice vax people, the people who think that people should have a choice, they're already vaccinated. They're, they're, and and it, that doesn't make sense to call somebody who's been vaccinated anti-vax. And so, you know, just like George Orwell with uh, a different a different book, 1984, where now we're changing the meaning of language. Now we've got that with the Biden administration, which we've had that for many years in politics. But I think it's just gotten to a whole new level this time. Mm -hmm. uh so now talking about our mission with Lola is to bring more women to the liberty side and to empower these women in, in, within the liberty, the liberty movement. So uh, what's your view? What's your opinion? Uh, we, have, we don't have a lot of women in politics. When we have, they are either conservatives or leftists. Mm -hmm. How do you think as libertarians, as liberty-minded women, we can address this problem? Well, I think a great thing to do would be to address concerns that women have and build a movement. I, I don't know how much you've been following the United States, but we've had women change the political landscape um, by up in Loudoun County, uh, Virginia, by going to their school boards and saying, hey, I'm the parent. I have the right to decide what my child is taught in school. And notice, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Notice it was a male governor who said, no, parents don't have the right to, to say what their kids learn in school. And so we've got a movement that was really created and powered by women. And so I think the, you know, people, and, and I'm gonna put on my psychology hat here, People tend to look at models uh, <clears throat> who are of the same sex. Same sex models are the most powerful. And that's true, by the way, with children and their parents. So uh, the father is the most powerful role model for a son and the mother, <clears throat> excuse me, is the most powerful role model for a daughter. And so, if you can be role models to women out there whose voices aren't being heard, just like here in the United States, these women's voices were not being heard uh, when they were saying, hey, this is my child. I have a right to decide what my child learns and how he or she learns it. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, we had the same situation, the whole same situation with schools too. In fact, Brazil was one of the uh, the countries where it lasts the most, uh, the shutdowns in schools. And uh, uh, yeah, and then we know this is a very uh, liberty uh, principle, how we're going to raise our children and how we are going to educate them too, and where we want to educate them <laughs> with, within which principles. But we know that it is not, sometimes it is not as easy of understanding the liberty philosophy. So Amanda Vitória, she's our um, a leader in, uh, in the state of Pernambuco in Brazil. She has a question and she says, how to turn the ideas of liberty easier of understanding for the big and common public so it can become votes for us? I would answer that the same way, which is to find an issue that's already there. You know, think about if you're a salesperson. And, and by the way, I, I was a salesperson. And I think that that's what helped me. I sold computers for IBM. And so I would go out to people who needed computers to get, you know, quicker reports, or maybe their distribution center was a mess because uh, they didn't have the information they needed, or maybe they weren't getting their tax returns done. Um, on time because they couldn't get their information. So I would look for what they needed and then showed how we could help them. And I think that's a big mistake that the Libertarian Party made when it first started in the 1970s and 80s. And if you don't mind a slightly longer answer here, when the Libertarian Party was first founded, there weren't a lot of organizations out there that were talking about liberty. And there was even a debate as to whether or not libertarians should even 
run people for office. <laughs> Some people thought that the Libertarian Party should be just educational only. Well, now the Libertarian Party doesn't need to be educational only because we've got, you know, the Cato Institute, freedom, you know, we've got people for liberty. Yes. Um, we've got, well, and even Reason Magazine was there slightly before the Libertarian Party. But the point is, is you've got to, in, in politics, you've got to remember that your job is to get votes and elect people. It's not to educate people. And I'm not even sure it's to change their minds. It's to find a problem that's there and be a salesperson and persuade them how you can answer their problem better. I mean, think about it. If somebody comes into a store, let, let, let's say you're let, let's say you own a you're a car salesperson, and the person comes in and says, "Okay, I'm a mother, and I've got three kids." and I need this minivan, you know, and I need some, I need a big car to carry my family with. You'd be a very bad salesman if you said, oh, well, you know what? I think you would look sexy in this hot little convertible. Let me explain to you why you need this convertible. No, <laughs> instead of changing their minds and trying to persuade them on something that they don't say they want, show them how you've got the best minivan out there why they need to absolutely buy that minivan today because they're not going to find a better one and that their kids are going to be better their family's going to be better her husband's going to be happier the whole family's going to be better mm -hmm. well you said something very interesting uh, in brazil and, and that's a difference of having libertarians in, inside and outside of the of the political um Bureau. In Brazil, we do that. We do know that we need our libertarian uh, members in office because we want them to stop bad laws of being approved to. And in Brazil, we started electing female um, candidates, libertarians, because we do have a bad law in Brazil, which is women cannot tie their tubes unless they follow lots of uh, requirements. One of which. The husband consentment. The husband one needs to consent with this. Yes. And so this so is that, the kind that, of Yeah, that sounds like a great topic right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do, do you think the women would be behind you on that one? No, no. Well, that's a great question though. I will let our our members say it uh, at the at the end when what's their opinion. Yeah. Because we do have lots of conservatives. Yes. So okay. Lots of the, the, the requirements are you need to have already two children, alive children, and we do need to, to be older than 25. So you need to follow all of the requirements for this. Well, that's Sometimes a great question. you need the, your husband approval? Yes, and, and the husband approval too. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, libertarians provide a great answer for conservatives as well. For instance, uh, looking, and, and I usually don't bring up abortion, but since mm -hmm. we're kind of on this, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's a slightly different topic here, mm -hmm. but um, it's still considered to be something that's important to women. Um, the Libertarian Party platform is pro-choice. Um, now, whether it should be pro-choice or pro-life, I mean, I, I do think that there's a pro-life argument that could be made for libertarians, because you could say that the fetus is a person who deserves rights, but I, I, I don't want to get into philosophy here. But here's what's important. I've had a lot of Republicans, Republican women, you know, again, conservative, say, well, I'm pro-life and I could never vote for somebody who's pro-choice. And I point out that, the libertarian or the, the Republican party claims to be pro-life. Their platform says they're pro-life, but many Republicans have voted to fund, to give money to Planned Parenthood for abortions. And so I said, even the staunchest pro-choice libertarian would never take a penny of taxpayer dollars to pay for abortions. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so, you know, whereas the Republican might take your money for abortions, even though they say they're against it, the libertarians say you should be able to live your life how you want to. And so if you're conservative, if you're religious, 
and your religion isn't mainstream, guess what? You get to live your religion how you want to. You get to homeschool your kids. If you don't want your kids to have you know, sex ed, then you don't have to give them sex ed. If you're against abortion, nobody's going to spend your money on abortion. So the freedom is a very good answer for conservatives as well, because they can lead their lives how they want without their money being used against their religious ideas. Mm -hmm. I was very recently reading uh, Grover Nor Norquist's book, yes. and he talks exactly about that. He says, well, I don't really care about what people are talking about abortion. He doesn't really care. And he says, I'm not going into it. And at the end of the day, we need, uh, we need the votes. But, and he's all about taxes. So he says, as, as long as we're not paying for other people abortions, like people who really disagree with abortion are not paying for people doing it, he's fine with it. But we know that it's not, it's not a common sense among um, Republicans and libertarians. Right. And I never, I never once brought up abortion on the campaign. No, okay. and, and, and you know what? Um, I, I got asked about it maybe once or twice the entire time. Uh, there's actually, and I don't know about Brazil, but in the United States, there's a very small vocal group of people who are pro-choice or pro-life. But other than that, most people, are, mo most people are concerned about the economy, jobs, education, healthcare, those kinds of things. So I, I didn't bring it up. And, and it's, it, it's almost like it's a, it's a lose lose to, to, um, to, to, to even talk about it. And, and notice the, the, you know, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, they didn't emphasize it either. Mm -hmm. And even though they are in completely opposite sides of it, too. Well, they say they are. I mean, you got to know that Donald Trump probably wouldn't have minded if one of his wives had gotten an abortion. Mm -hmm. But what? But that's the problem. Once you're for the Democrats or Republicans, now you're you've got sometimes an arbitrary position. And and let me just mention. I know you didn't ask me this question, but I think this is one of the problems that we have with politics, is that it that the and, and I noticed that they, they told me some of the questions that you were going to ask me. And, and one of them was ideological. Mm -hmm. And the Democrats, well, well, do you mind if I answer that? Do you want to read that question? And then I'll answer oh, it. Yes, yes, I can do it. It was a question from Marilia Dantas. She's from the state of Paraíba. So she said, uh, do you think that it is important to have the ideological voters? And uh, what's the importance of having that kind of votes yeah to me all votes should be ideological and unfortunately what we're seeing right now in the united states uh the democratic party has always been the anti-war party they're the pro-peace they're the people who in the 1960s and 70s demonstrated in the streets you know big demonstrations uh against the vietnam war so then we've got Donald Trump in office, right? Who's a Republican. Well, um, when he said he wanted to bring the troops home, the most vocal critics were the Democrats. They were saying, no, you can't bring them home. I mean, it's like, what are you saying? You, you guys are the anti-war people, but they didn't want to bring the troops home because Donald Trump wanted to do it. And then of course, when Joe Biden gets in office, now he does want to bring the troops home. So we've gotten literally in the United States, a red team versus a, a blue team to where they don't even stand for anything anymore. And in fact, in the 1980s, when people, you know, before a lot of people heard about libertarianism, they would ask me, um, what's a libertarian? And I would say, well, it takes the best of the Democrats and the best of the Republicans. You know, we believe that you should be able to marry who you want to marry, love who you want to love, uh, you know, free speech, say what you want to say. But we also believe that you should run your business how you want to, that you should be able to protect yourself with a gun, that you should be able to enter into a contract with your employer and you agree on what you get paid, not the government. Well. 
I can't say that anymore because the Democrats and Republicans, they're, they're both spending a lot of money. They're both telling people how to live their lives. And there's really not a whole lot of difference. Mm -hmm. Well, what I, what I, a saying that I heard here in the U.S. that's that I like about the Libertarian Party is that they are trying to take uh, the government from your pocket and from your bed too, uh, in the opposite of what. The <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, talking about that, what do you think? Uh, one uh, another quick thing that I agree with you on it. Uh, we saw that the uh, the Demo the Republicans were the pro-market party, and then we saw Trump doing all of the war with, with China. And at the same time now with Biden, uh, Kamala, come at, supposedly the Democrats are the pro-immigration uh, party. And then we see Kamala saying uh, many bad things about the people from Haiti crossing the border and telling them, do not cross because it's not going to be good. So they're doing different things of uh, what they stand for. Exactly, because they no longer stand for anything, because they're no longer ideological. It's it's whatever the other guy doesn't do. I mean, I, I really didn't think it had gotten as bad as it had gotten. I really thought that when Trump said he'd want to bring the troops home, I thought, okay, finally, here's something the Democrats and Republicans can both agree on. And they didn't, because they're going to say, whatever that guy does, I'm doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to change a little bit of the topic because I'm going to address some other questions here. But, you know, something that happens to us, especially me uh, now, uh, Joe, that I travel representing Lola, many times, some, I was, when we were at the Fear Future Fest, mm -hmm. some young guys came to, to my table and they said, oh, that's very rare to find a libertarian woman by herself who is not a libertarian because of the husband or the father or something like that. And uh, which is true. If we go to big events, we're going to see the wives there. We are not going to see the independent women standing for liberty by themselves. And if the wife is there, it's usually not the wife bringing the husband. It's the husband bringing the wife. Correct. You're right about that too. Uh, so we have uh, Natasha and Viviani, they're both from Lola and they have a specific question. Uh, do you think that uh, you were treated different because you were a woman uh, running for office in a very male dominant, dominant party? And they asked you, what was the, big, the biggest challenge of being a libertarian woman uh, running? Well, first of all, I've never run as a man, so I can't tell you exactly what the difference is. Um, even though, if, if, okay, the reason that the Libertarian Party has traditionally been male dominated is because we started off very much, you know, very logical, rational, Ayn Rand, black and white. So it attracted a lot of people who were men, you know, it, it, computer engineers, programmers, uh, engineers, and just people who were, who were very much uh, black and white logical, right? And women, um, you know, and well, let me back up. And, 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 and that's what attracted me. And, and I, I was always very big in math and science. And so I read Ayn Rand, and I thought, yeah, this makes sense that each person gets to spend his own money. And you can see how it is much better for poor people, for uh, minorities, for any disadvantaged group to have a situation in which each person gets to decide how to spend their own money. But then we would be accused of, well, you don't want to help the poor people. You don't care about Blacks. And it's, it's really easy to come up with a slogan if you're running for office. It's really easy to say, yes, I'm going to give them money. Yes, I'm going to help them. Yes, we're going to give those people money. We're going to help them. It's a, it's a much longer and difficult explanation to give an economic argument as to how that actually hurts the people you're trying to help. 
You know, um, uh, there's a great book called Losing Ground. It's a little, it's outdated, but, you know, very thick book. And he goes through and very logically explains how uh, people are being hurt by the welfare programs in the United States. But see, that takes too long of an, of a, you know, even me explaining this to, is taking a long time. And so uh, anyway, uh, a lot of people, and you know, this would be a good, this would be a good um, study, I guess, would be to see how women and men vote differently. Uh, a lot of people mistakenly think that women are more, more emotional than men, but that's not what the psychological research shows. Psychological research shows that men are just as emotional as women, but <clears throat> something I hadn't looked into and I need to is do they vote by emotions differently? And that might be the case because of why we have um, so many more male libertarians. But I would say I would, I the, the biggest challenge I had, and, and since, since you guys are running, let me tell you about something that happened to me on the campaign trail of something that maybe to look out for. I'm hearing feedback all of a sudden. Lisa, are you aware of this? I'm um, listening to you. Okay. okay. Well, this is the first time I've gotten feedback since I've been here. But no, if, it is if, not. I think Ana Lucia. Ana Lucia is with her mic on. She needs to turn it off. Ana Lucia. Ana Lucia, please turn your mic off. Okay. 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 No, I still Everybody, hear Everybody, please, mic off. And Joe, one comment that we in Lula Brazil, uh, in the meantime, when they, they put the mic off, one comment that uh, uh, we in Lula Brazil always make is that people vote rationally. So if you don't talk about, uh, about uh, taking care of the child or, or education or stuff that women are socially, uh, socially responsible for, we will not uh, be we will not be uh, re responsive to this public. So we have to to adjust our discourse to reach women. That's the whole point. Yes, and you know, thank you because you reminded me of the point I was trying to make, and then I kind of got off topic, which is the Libertarian Party had the problem in the 1970s and 80s, especially being very logical, computer oriented, saying it's my money, it's my property, it's my body, I should be able to do what I want with it, which is not a good emotional appeal because then people say, oh, you're selfish, you don't care about poor people. Instead, we need to flip it around and say, you know, there are people out there without food. And here's why. It's because these government programs are taking money out of the hands of the charities, out of. And one of the things that drew me to the Libertarian Party, when I was in college, there was a um, somebody had given me a statistic. I, I went to a speaker. And the statistic was, if you're going to get a dollar, now, now this is back in the 1970s, okay? I don't know what it is now. But back in the 1970s, if you're going to get a dollar, from somebody who wants to donate that dollar to give that dollar to charity to the person who needs help. <clears throat> it costs something like 10 cents for a church to get that dollar from the person who wants to give to the person in need. It costs something like, you know, 35 cents for a private charity to do that, like Goodwill or Red Cross or something like that. It took a dollar 28 or something like that to get a dollar from somebody who needed it to somebody who is in need through the government. In other words, it cost over a dollar to get that dollar to somebody who needs help. And so uh, uh, it, and, and of course, because government is inefficient, there's nobody that's, tr that's holding the lid on expenses. Whereas if you're in a church, you know, the, the, they're not going to have a large bureaucracy and they're and and churches and private organizations are going to better know who really needs the help than the government when the government, you know, could be a, a thousand miles away. Mm -hmm. um, 
But to more answer the question on men versus women, there was somebody, I had an assistant with me at the time who we had, well, my campaign had gotten the time zone wrong or something. And so they got a, they got a quick message, hey, can Joe jump on real quick and, and be a part of this uh, podcast? Well, it was in the morning. I had just gotten back from running. And, you know, I was still, you know, sweaty in my, you know, in my t-shirt and, you know, had my hair pat back in a ponytail. And the person who was helping me that day said, well, Dr. Jorgensen's not ready yet because she hasn't done hair and makeup. And afterwards I was like, no, don't ever say that. Because here's the thing. And, and so, you know, advice to any woman who's running. You don't want to give the impression that, oh, because you're a woman, because of course, I, I, I don't know about Brazil, but in the United States, men don't tend to have their hair and makeup done professionally <laughs> so every, you know, before going on TV or, or before going on a podcast, rather, TV they do. But um, here's the thing. If I had been a man, I wouldn't have been ready either because I still wouldn't have taken a shower I still wouldn't have shaved you know in other words a man has to get ready too not just women so you don't want to give the impression that oh be okay because you're a woman now you need extra time or you need something special or anything like that so it just needs to be you know that the candidate you know the candidate uh isn't prepared yet and not specifically say hair and makeup as opposed to shaved and showered. Because, and you know, uh, probably an assistant for a male candidate wouldn't say the same thing. They probably wouldn't say, oh, well, the senator hasn't shaved yet. <laughs> you know, they would never say that. <laughs> but they might say something like, there's never makeup on, so. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, great, that's a great example. Because we, and, and, and that's another thing uh, that we, we're not standing for E egalitarianism with men is not about being equal it's about it's about being recognized as free as them to do what we what we want to build our path our own path so i, I like that uh this uh yeah oh i'm just and i'm sorry to this is off topic i'm just really curious because you said you wanted to be equal for a man to get a vasectomy, does he need his wife's signature? He does. Okay. Yeah, so but it is it oh. is quite less bureaucratic. It is quite less bureaucratic. Yeah. Uh, so like the the male has to has to have the the approval, but in the case of women, sometimes even if the woman has the approval of the husband, has the the correct age, has everything, sometimes the doctor simply refuses to do because they think they can be sued because uh yeah. in the case of women is women is not like reversible so right. they they always think they can be sued and sometimes they refuse and yeah. so it is quite more bureaucratic to women to to do the sex to do the 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 I did too. yeah I did. so for that is why men do a lot of more vasectomy than women and there is and there is a difference too. Man only does vas vasectomy when he is uh, in a relationship with a family, and then it's easier than for the for the than the female. But uh, the the women still need to wait thirty days. They ca they cannot use the same day that they they delivered to do the surgery, for instance. So it's as Cecilia said, is a little bit much more uh bureaucratic for for women this yeah this whole regulation but but at least there's some kind of equality there <laughs> yes they are both conservative well for the both sides yeah okay so i'm just gonna get the last questions before we get up uh, questions uh the q a from the audience larissa oliveira she's our leader in the state of paraiba mm -hmm. She made a question, uh, which is, what is the best way to approach for a potent potential new voter? How can we uh, do this approach, especially if they are not uh, well convinced about being a libertarian or how, how is this approach with new voters? How was, 
how was it in your experience last year and the past campaigns? Yeah, my experience was good, especially given, you know, the two people who were running. But the way I approach a new voter, again, I approach it as, as salesmanship, as being a salesperson. And I ask them, what's important to you? And then depending on that answer, I show them how I, you know, it's just like if, if somebody comes into my car dealership and they say, well, I want a sexy sports car because I want to pick up women, then I show them the, the Maserati. If they say I've got a family of six, then I show them the SUV. So I do it based on what that person says. And, um, and let me mention, because I noticed one of the questions in the chat was about selling freedom. Now, you might not want to hear this, but this I strongly believe this. I, on the campaign trail, didn't talk about liberty and freedom. I talked about issues that affected people. I talked about affordable health care. I talked about choosing your child's education. I talked about making the environment better because now, and it might be different in Brazil, okay? So maybe Brazil maybe it would be better to talk about freedom. But in the United States, another problem that the libertarians had for many decades is they would go around saying, we're the party of freedom, we're the party of liberty. And voters' eyes would glaze over and they would say, well, we're already the freest country on earth. You know, basically, if you look at the voters' top 10 polls, what they're interested in, you know, jobs, the economy, uh, healthcare, social security, whatever, uh, freedom is never in the top of the list. <laughs> People aren't going around saying, I want freedom. So what we have to do is translate for them and show them how freedom gives them the, you know, here's how freedom gives you the best education. You're free to be able to choose what you want to teach your kids. Here's how freedom helps with healthcare. You can have your choice of providers and you can have people who are maybe alternative medicine or whatever. So, so you show how it helps them. That's great. That's a great strategy that you need to, to, to try to convince them saying the truth Mm -hmm. but in a way that you agree with and you're not trying to put that person away from you. You're trying right. to bring that person. And then later you can talk about freedom and then later the person can understand. Right, and, and you know, and I made that mistake too. When I first became a libertarian, I thought, well, this is great. It makes so much sense. Yes, it's my body and it's my money and everybody should have the freedom to do what they want. And it, I, I was shocked that people didn't see how great that was and so uh so yeah so i no longer lead with freedom and liberty now you can show how freedom and liberty help the problem but you got to address the problem because people have problems they want solved yes okay so i'm uh i'm gonna uh, ask for the first question uh the first one is gonna be monica Rosenberg. you can ask your question for dr joe Hello, thank you, Isa. Hey. Hey. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can I can see you. Well, my question is about minority rights. In Brazil, many people believe that the liberal agenda does not fit properly with defending the rights of minorities. And in Sao Paulo, which is where I live, we have a councilwoman who is actually Lola, and I think she's watching. And she has, she has been entering into all of these fights and has received a lot of criticism. And I would like to know your opinion on how you can uh, address both of these agendas, which are very important. Okay, so both agendas, the agenda of minority rights and what else? The liberal agenda. Giving liberal agenda. Okay, yes. Um, well, first of all, there's, I, I like to kind of twist it around on people. And if, if there's a liberal talking about minorities, then say something like, you know, why do you think that you should spend the money that belongs to blacks and women? What, no, why not? Just, just, just a, a comment is that in Brazil, liberal equals to libertarian. So we are talking about oh, libertarian classical here. Liberal. Uh, classical and, uh, liberal. And classical liberal. And what, okay. what Monica was saying is that we have a city councilor here from Lola, Cris Monteiro. She's here. Uh, she can say hello and if she wants. 
but uh, and the point is that she is fighting the the against the trans transgender violence in São Paulo. Ah. So so the question Monica Monica's question is more about uh, this relationship from classical liberal agenda and the minorities' rights. Yeah. So I don't know enough about Brazilian culture to actually to be able to answer that question because again i believe in concrete answers and concrete examples and so for instance in the united states i talk about how when the slaves were first freed for the first 10 years they did great you know they were they were, and this was by the way back in the 1860s uh they did uh uh, they were excellent craftsmen, did great work. They were willing to work harder for a cheaper price because, uh, you know, they were starting off their own business. And that's what I did when I started my business is I offered a cheaper price to get people to use me. And so they were taking away all the customers from the whites. And so what the whites did was they said, how can we compete? Oh, let's pass laws. And so then we've got Jim Crow laws, which basically pass laws that, uh, you know, that they couldn't do that. Also, uh, I don't know how well known the Rosa Parks example is known in Brazil, but here, you know, Rosa Parks was a black woman who refused to sit on the back of the bus. Well, what a lot of people don't know, and I would point out, is that that bus was a government run, government owned bus, and that only the government has the power to discriminate like that. That if this were Uber or Lyft, I guess you have Uber and Lyft there, right? <laughs> if this were Uber and you discriminated against the best 60, 70% of your customers, which is you know, blacks were the overwhelming majority of bus riders. So if Uber comes along and discriminates against the best 70% of their customers, they're going to go out of business as well they should. Because in the free market, you have to you have to please your customer to get them to repeat it. And also Milton Friedman's idea. Milton Friedman pointed out, if I am a baker and I need to buy flour and if I can buy flour cheaper from the black person than the white person, I'm probably going to buy flour from the black person because I can make a bigger profit. If I buy, now, could you buy flour from the white person? Sure, but you're more likely to go out of business. What the government does is the government puts in all of these rules that now makes it easier for the person to buy from the white person and not go out of business. So basically that the government is there to help the people in power. But, but you know, I don't know the Rosa Parks story of Brazil or, you know, any specific examples there. But if in, in a free market, you have to work for your customer. The government never has to work. Um, and let me give you one other example, because this might be relevant to Brazil. So um, we've got health inspectors that come and look at you know, restaurants to make sure that they're clean and so forth. Well, it's easy to pay off a health inspector. Uh, health inspectors get paid off all the time in the United States and nothing gets helped. And, and if they find a health inspector who gets paid off, they fire them and nothing happens. If, however, your Yelp or you're the mobile restaurant guide or the Zagat guide, and you're not truthful, then you go out of business. You know, like consumer reports. Consumer reports would go out of business if they were telling people to buy the dangerous stuff. If the government tells people to buy the dangerous stuff, they never go out of business. Thank you very much, Joe. And I liked uh, how you would address for the liberals in America, asking them, would you take money from black people and mothers to right. pay the privileges of the bureaucrats in office? Yep. Yeah, that's a great answer too. So I'll keep uh, going with the queue. Next one is Beatriz Gagliardo. So hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. see you too. Okay, great. So first of all, uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Cecilia, to invited me. 
So a quick way presentation, but we'll connect with my question. Okay, so I'm a, I am a government relations professional here in Brazil for more than 15 years. Mm -hmm. I am a leader and co-author of a book that we've recently launched called uh, Government Relation Under a Female Perspective. Some uh, co-authors is uh, be here on this meeting, uh, Suelma Rosa and Dana Beatriz. So I'm a gladder to be here to uh, uh, in the same uh, event to discuss uh, politics. So, and I am also president of an association called Women in Government Relation. And my question is, what's your opinion? Um, and if you can share your experience also regarding how does kind of uh, this initiative, formal or informal groups that could effect effectively um, promote to gender equality and uh, more women on the political space here in Brazil. If you can share your experience in the United States, it will be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm trying to... Yeah, we never did pass the what they call the Equal Rights Amendment, which makes them equal. But again, I would rather fight for the free market because the free market is going to do a much better job of making things equal for women than the government ever could. Uh, for a lot of the reasons I just gave you, but you know, but those deal with minorities and uh, as opposed to women. Uh, for instance, I started working for IBM in uh, 1980. And when I joined, the rookie of the year was a woman selling computers, by the way, from West Virginia, which is like out in the middle of nowhere. And the rookie of the year in my region was a black man from Guyana. Now, if IBM had discriminated, they wouldn't have these two good employees, one of them, you know, rookie of the year for the entire country being a woman. Uh, and, and at the time, and by the way, 1980, uh, companies were still regularly discriminating against women. Uh, in fact, I was discriminated against in my own little um, uh, group. But if with widespread, uh, you know, if, like I said, if those were two of the top salespeople in the entire country. And if you discriminate them against them, you're going to go out of business. And so if you look at government, if if they're so non-discriminatory, I mean, look at Joe Biden, who he surrounds himself with. He's a white male. And notice he even said, well, we need a woman of color. You know, I'm, I'm going to choose a woman of color to be my VP. Why didn't he say, you know what, I'll be the VP. How about let's have a woman of color be the presidential nominee? You know, I'll step down and I'll let the woman of color do that. They never do that in government. And, and if you look at who has the power, it's still a lot of white men. And the, you know, when people vote with their dollars, vote with their feet, then you tend to get less discrimination. Uh, again, if you have a woman selling flour, then the baker's gonna buy from a woman if she can provide the best uh, price. Thank you very much. Uh, we have only two more questions. Next one's going to be Suelma, and then after her, we're going to have Chris. Uh, only, yes. a quick, only a quick comment, uh, Dr. Joe. Uh, we have two elected, two of our elected members of Lola here, Marcela, as I said, and Chris, right now. And I'd like to thank you again for all of you guys and girls and ladies of liberty participation. Uh, as I, as is told in the beginning, uh, we have a very qualified audience here. We have Jason Ferreira of Chamber of Deputies and she works in the Secretary of Women here in Brazil. And we have Selma Rosa, she is the president of IHELGOV and a supporter of Elas do Poder. It's a women's movement to support a woman who, who wants to run in Brazil. And we have also, thank you, Beatriz Gagliado. We have, she she had a- Cecilia. 
now. Cecile, but we yes. have two questions. We still have two questions. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone. We have so great people here. And uh, I will pass to Suelma now. Suelma, you can ask your question now. Thank you. <clears throat> Very quick question, uh, just being responsible with the back time. Um, Dr. Joe Brazil, it's a very state driven economy mindset country. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it's highly nickel country. Uh, and, and the libertarian argument, it's, it's hard to rely to people because of this sort of mindset. So, my question is how to reconcile this idea of fighting equality and poverty? in a limited government context that libertarianism proposed, uh, considering all that, uh, inequality, unequal access, lack of inclusiveness and all. Thank you so much. Yeah, again, I would ask somebody, who do you think is going to be better at helping the poor, your church or your government bureaucrat? And I think the answer is simple. <laughs> okay, and then now Chris. Um, hi, hello. Thank you very much. I guess my question was addressed by Suelma to some extent because I had a, a very similar concern as her, you know, and, and I struggle with that quite a lot being a liberal party because it's quite hard. I understand you, Joe. Yes, I don't think the government will solve the problem of the poor. However, at the current state, we have people starting from very different starting line, mm -hmm. right? So we have a massive black people, massive poor people. The inequality here is ridiculous and got even worse with the pandemic uh, situation. So I'm okay because my life is right, it's, it's nice, it's fine, but what do we do in the meantime? How do we reconcile those people who are far away behind, without education, without health, without uh, income, without jobs, um, you know, can they wait for the society to be, you know, in order so we can apply all of the very classic liberal aspects? Yeah, no, they can't wait. And you really need something like Brexit to happen. And I think if you do on both fronts at the same time, like show how charity can help the poor better while um, trying to vote in the people that you want for office. But Brexit, when, when Brexit came about within like six weeks, they had the vote before the government. So it needs to be a movement and it needs to be a changing of the people's minds, not a changing of the government's minds. And do you mind if I answer a question I saw on your list that nobody asked me? Yes, of course, please go yeah. ahead. Real, real quick on gun rights. Uh, yes, I believe anybody should be able to own a gun and guns are the great equalizer for women. If somebody broke into, if a man breaks into a woman's house, chances are the man is going to be stronger and can overpower her. So the gun is the great equalizer. Also speaking from my, you know, I have a degree in psychology, the most violent people on the planet are uh, roughly 20 year old men. And so the, the way a woman can combat that violence is with a gun. And there have been many cases where uh, women have been on a waiting list to get a gun, you know, for a background check. Meanwhile, her stalker or her ex-husband or her ex-boyfriend already has a gun and then she gets shot while she's waiting in the waiting line. So those, it tends to hurt women more than men to not be able to defend themselves. Thank you so very much. I like to, to sorry, Isa, I'd like to uh -huh. thank very much to our elected Lola's here. Chris is here and Marcela Tropia is here and Indiara, I'm not sure if she's still here, but she was here, Indiara Barrosa. So I like just to say congratulations to them and say that all, all Lola community admire a lot this courage to run for office and to be able to get elected. And uh, Dr. Joe, you are 
a completely uh, example for us. We do admire you a lot. Everything, <laughs> everything that you do here, there in the U.S. We can we can disagree in many topics for sure. It happens to everybody here. Me and our and my fellow Lola members in Brazil, we don't agree on everything. So it would never happen with us and you, of course. But we are so glad to to get to listen to you and to have this conversation. I'm sure it was uh, great for everybody. And uh, to finish, would you mind to, uh, we, I would like to ask everybody to open the cameras. We would like to take a picture of this moment on a screenshot, if you don't mind. So everybody, was it clear? Did you say anything, Dr. Joe? Oh, I said, okay. I think my oh. camera is already open, right? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. So let's, one, two, and tease. Jeez. <laughs> I hope that Lila or Cecilia are doing this, right? Someone I wasn't I wasn't doing this actually. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> great, great. Once again. Lila, were you doing this? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so we, we got it. So, and uh, Dr. Joe, I will uh, let uh, the president of Lola Brazil, Cecilia Lopes, uh, to, to give uh, the final uh, words so we can finish. But once again, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Hey, Joe. So, hey, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Uh, this is a, a great achievement for us because we are beginning our our nucleo de candidaturas. Uh, like I, I don't know how to say exactly in English, but we are like supporting candidates, Lola candidates, to be elected next year. So this is the beginning of a huge project, and we we really want to engage women and engage people that want to work to these women to these liberty-minded women. So we we are so glad that you were you were able to be here. We are we are so glad for this moment. And we really hope that on 2022 we'll be able to have even more uh elected Lolas in Congress, on the state, state congresses, and and we are really passionate by this idea of really bringing women from a liberal classical liberal perspective to to the public office so thanks a lot everyone uh and and keep following you because we will have always great news on this project isa do you want to say something more uh, uh you, you guys can follow follow lola on instagram too our our user is Somos Lola Brasil. No, I'm and that's fine. It. That's it. Bye bye, Dr. Joe. Once again, bye bye, everyone. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye, guys. Bye bye, guys. Thank you for discussion. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a great weekend. Thank bye bye. You. Thank you very much.